Okay, I want to thank everybody for coming to B&H. And um, as David said, I plan to accomplish uh, two objectives. Uh, the first and primary, uh, among other things, is to demystify and explain uh, the um, use of small, portable, off-camera, remote uh, speed lights or flashes or whatever we want to call them. And the second is I'm going to introduce you to the New York Botanical Gardens in the Bronx, which is the only way I can really describe it is as a photographer's nirvana. I mean, this place is unbelievable. Um, I was looking at the registration page for uh, this particular workshop, and I noticed in my bio it was mentioned that I spent countless hours experimenting at the Bronx Botanical Gardens. I started thinking about that, and I said to myself, what person in their right mind would spend countless hours in a place such as this? Well, if you enjoy taking photos of flowers, plants, trees, forests, varied landscapes, historical buildings and structures, birds, it's one of the best birding places in this area, uh, small mammals, and I'm not talking about uh, you know rabbits and squirrels. I'm talking about muskrats. Uh, they're they're just jumping around and they're they're hanging out in the lakes over there. You can see them. Very very cute little animals. There's even beaver over there, but uh, you really got to get there at some strange times to find it. You can see the results of them when they uh, start uh, chopping down some of the trees in the area. Um, reptiles. A couple of really big snapping turtles there. Amphibians. And the main draw are the conservatory shows. Uh, the conservatory is a historical landmark building over in the New York Botanical Gardens. It's like a gigantic glass greenhouse for displays. And one of their premier shows is the Orchid Show. And I'm going to be really highlighting that uh, today, this year's past Orchid Show. Uh, the big problem with the orchid show or the conservatory shows is you cannot use tripods or monopods. And the main reason for that, even though it's a very, very large area, they do get crowds, the um, paths in there are narrow, and it would really impede the flow of traffic. And I'm sure you've all seen the photographer who falls in love with the subject and forgets anybody else is there and doesn't want to move. So, you know, they really have to keep us moving. And since I do teach there, uh, I really wanted to try to work on methods of achieving very, very good close-ups or macro uh, without using a tripod. Now remember, you're going to be using a long lens, by a long lens, uh, usually something that's over 15 millimeters, and you're going to be using apertures in the double digits. So that means there's very little available light. And that means a shutter speed of over one second. And there's no way you could handhold and get a decent shot. So I've been working with these particular strobes. Okay, before I go any further, I also want to tell you about my views of photography and um, my instructional methodology. To me, at this stage, I look at photography <coughs> as a fine art form where the camera, lenses, and accessories becomes my paintbrush, my paint, my palette, my canvas, and my easel. And if I'm doing monochrome black and white, it becomes my graphite, my graphite holder, and my paper. I plan each time when I go out to photograph what I'm going to do and I try to get the image in my mind's eye, and I try to get it right in the camera. I really don't see myself sitting there and getting lousy images and playing with Photoshop to correct it. Because if it's a lousy image, it's always going to be a lousy image. I try to get it all the time correct in the camera. OK, the other thing is my views on uh, instruction. Uh, one thing that I really detest are how-to classes, you know, any how-to. And my rationale for that is, if I'm doing something very technical or someone is doing something technical, there's only one way of doing it. And therefore, you have to do how-to. Because if you don't do how-to and somebody presses the wrong switch, there are problems. But with photography, 
there are so many, so many ways of doing something. And whenever I mention something, I am going to say, why? I know in my own educational experiences coming up uh, through elementary school and through graduate school, I always like to know why. I'm a science person. I always wanted to know why. And, but I soon learned at a very early age that if the instructor either wouldn't answer or would beat around the bush, never, never push it. Especially since I wanted a grade from the person and they probably didn't know the answer. So, you know, it was one of the ways of uh, understanding what is going on. Uh, I'm going to start by showing you a slideshow video that I prepared from the 2013 Orchid Show, which uh, was over at the New York Botanical Gardens. Um, it ran from March through April. Uh, the shot that you see here right now uh, is actually of a chrysanthemum, the Kiku. And as I'm speaking, the Kiku Show is going on right now at the New York Botanical Gardens, and it's going to run until the end of this month. Okay, anyway, with this slideshow, uh, I want to tell you a bit about the equipment that I used. Um, there are many images in there. I used a compact camera system. The camera I used was the G11, which as David mentioned, when I got rid of it and bought the G15, they came out with the G16, what could I tell you? Uh, what I mean by a compact system camera is a camera that does not have interchangeable lenses. It comes with a uh, lens on it that uh, is a zoom lens, usually from wide angle to telephoto. Basically, it's an advanced point and shoot camera. Uh, but this one has a bit more capabilities. The speed light that I used was a Canon 430EX, and I had a generic diffuser on it. A diffuser is a um, milky white colored um, translucent piece of plastic that diffuses the light to soften the effect so you do not get harsh shadows. Uh, the, um, I had some brackets that were made by Really Right Stuff. And uh, for my trigger, I used the Canon Speedlight Transmitter STE2. Okay, for the digital SLRs, I used for a full frame a Nikon D800 and for my DX or APS frame I used a D300S. Uh, a full frame digital camera has a sensor in it which is the approximate size of a piece of 35 millimeter film. It is the sensor that you're really paying for with a digital <laughs> camera. It's the guts of the camera. It is what captures the image and then we'll transfer the image to uh, some type of storage media. The APS-C frames, uh, these are a bit smaller than 35 millimeter because, as I said, the cost values. Uh, the um, Nikon calls them DX, Canon calls them the EFS, uh, and, and so on. The um, strobe that I used, or the flash, uh, when I was using uh, zoom lenses was the Nikon SB900. Uh, the two zoom lenses that I used was the uh, 28 to 300, and I then used the uh, 70 to 200. With the um, macro uh, equipment, um, I used uh, the, I had three macro lenses from Nikon. I have my good old trusty 60 millimeter, I have the 105 millimeter, and I have the 200. Uh, the um, triggering device for the Nikon, I use the SU-800. I will cover all of these as we do go on. It is another thing, um, David had mentioned that I do a great deal of experimentation. Well, I'm trying a little bit of an experiment today and it seems to be working out quite well. Most of the time when we do presentations, the standard is Microsoft PowerPoint. I mean, we use PowerPoint for everything. It does everything and then of course Apple has Keynote. And somebody once described Keynote as PowerPoint on steroids. I'm not using either of them. 
I'm using Lightroom. Whoever thought of Lightroom as presentation software? I love Lightroom. Uh, the slideshow that I just did was done on Lightroom. So we're really doing a lot of things on Lightroom. Um, the Orchid Show is coming up again over in the uh, New York Botanical Gardens. And uh, it's usually towards the end of the winter and early spring. And I'm working with them to teach a workshop on orchid photography. And I'm really we're working on doing it over two days. Uh, why two days? Because I want everybody there in the beginning to learn the equipment, see what to use, see how to use it, go over to the conservatory when it's packed with all of the people, so we could just walk around, survey the area first. And then, either the next day or the next week, we're going to come, we're going to be able to get in early and be able to be let loose in the conservatory before hours, get our shots with what we learned, then back to the educational building and just go over everything, critique everything. Um, they've never done that before, but I've been doing a little arm twisting there, and hopefully this is something that is going to um, work out with that. All righty, let's take a look. And this is Lightroom, not PowerPoint. This is my equipment when I want to travel light. Um, you know, not all the time do I feel like lugging along, uh, you know, a couple of DSLR bodies, big backpack and everything. I can't use a tripod, so I have to rely on utilizing the strobes. So I have my little Tamarack bag over there, and um, that little thing on the side of this thing here. Uh, this is a Really Right Stuff uh, Pro Flash Bracket, and that black rapid uh, Neshmet bag I carry a black rapid uh, shoulder strap in there, but also a lot of other things fit in there, and it's really great to handle. Okay, let's see what everything looks like out on the outside. Here we go. I don't have my G11 anymore. Uh, I upgraded to the G15. And let's take a look at some of these items. The L plate that you see on it on the bottom. Come on, stay. There we go. This is the L plate, and this is made by a company called Really Right Stuff, and it goes into the tripod socket on the bottom of the camera. <clears throat> really Right Stuff doesn't sell retail. They only sell direct. But whenever I have items that I want to upgrade from Really Right Stuff, I bring it here and sell it. So I use the palm, and if I see Really Right Stuff, a lot of it is probably coming from me. Uh, they're basically, their plate is similar to the Swiss Arca plates. All right, this is the, whoop, come on. <laughs> All right, there we go. Here's the Canon Speedlight Transmitter ST-E2. I hardly ever see anybody using it. I love it because I can carry it with me anywhere. Uh, this is an infrared transmitter. Uh, it sends out an infrared beam. Infrared is um, shortwave. It's very, uh, it's basically heat radiation. It's invisible to us. We can't see it. And that's what they use on a lot of the remotes that we have on the TVs and on the stereos and such. It won't go through walls. It won't go around corners. It's basically line of sight. Uh, it's not like the Pocket Wizard, which uses radio, but for the, the, this kind of system, uh, I, to get caught up with the Pocket Wizard would be uh, a little crazy. All right, here's my speed light in the back, and um, you can see the uh, diffuser on it. There's some Velcro pieces where I probably will use uh, some kind of bounce lighting system. And here is the really right stuff bracket all folded up. Here is a little foot that uh, you can place the speed light in. Okay, this looks a little strange, this thing over here on the end. You know, all of the cameras come with a shoulder strap. They're not allowed to call them neck straps anymore because I guess there are too many liabilities of some people getting dragged away by the bus, you know, with the strap around their neck. So they all come with a shoulder strap, and uh, the um, Canon here is no exception. But 
what I have is a little mini clamp from um, Really Right Stuff. And you can see it's got the little knurled wheel, and it'll adjust that clamp. And it fits nicely on the um, L-plate. So I can wear that around my neck. Uh, many times I have a few cameras with me, and this is not that heavy. I, I mean, it, you know, it's not going to weigh 15 or 20 pounds and break my neck. Um, I could wear it with it. I also have a small strap for my wrist. People say, why do you have so many straps? Well, I've seen a lot of bad things happen with small cameras. I've seen them fall off ships. I've seen people drop them off boats. I've seen people drop them into swimming pools. I've heard of people dropping them into toilets. Uh, and how many times do you see people, it falls off and it hits the concrete. My wife and I, we were in the uh, zoo about two years and we had the G11s and it was a really, really cold day and she was trying to get the camera off and, and it slipped. Luckily I had the L-plate on there because it hit the L-plate. Nine times out of 10, this never would have happened. There was no damage, fortunately. But these cameras are extremely sensitive. They hit the deck, you can kiss them goodbye. So always try to have them on you. Uh, the other thing is when you get a really costly camera, the last thing you want to do is have a shoulder strap that broadcasts in bright day glow letters. Super expensive camera. Because you go into a crowded area and the, the, the crooks look for this. You know, they see people in a crowd and they walk over with a, usually a straight razor and cut it and they walk away and then you see the person, where's my camera? Where's my camera? Try to avoid it. Um, I, I always use various generic straps. Uh, here you see everything set up. Here is the um, speed light sitting on its little foot. Here is the um, transmitter set up on top and here is my little handle. Okay, I set up the really right stuff pro bracket. It's nice, it folds up, boom. I dropped it in on the, um, that, that particular side of the camera. It's an L plate. It clamps in and if you notice right up on top here, this particular clamp is for the speed light. If I loosen that now, I can move it in many, many different ways, many different fashions. And here we are looking down at it. And if you notice, it says lock. That is going to really lock it into place. Uh, last week I was using this setup and uh, I was using it with my SP900 and um, I wasn't careful to lock it. It started moving around. I saw, you really have to double check uh, this material. And this on the back is where the um, uh, cold shoe will clamp in. So you can have tremendous, tremendous amount of flexibility. I like flexibility with the camera. I want to be in control. I want to see where the light is going, and this allows for it. Now, if you notice, I have it down, and you can see the actual speed light clipped in on it. There we go. Flexibility, look at that. I just moved it over to the side. All the way over. Yesterday I was over at the garden uh, at the uh, chrysanthemum show and what I did is I had that straight up and moved it down. People are looking at me like, oh, what's going on? It's great because this particular head, you can raise it at an angle and you can rotate it. So it's giving me so much more control. I'm often asked, what about the built-in speed light in the camera? I don't use it. It's a piece of junk. The only purpose that it serves, and I'll show you a little bit later with some of the Nikons, you can use it as a trigger. Maybe in an emergency, I, I, I just won't even bother taking a photo with it. Alrighty. Now that we see the equipment, I'd like to show you how the equipment is used, how I handle it, how it's with me. And um, I have a model, a very trustworthy model, who's exceptionally reliable. 
comes along with his own material. Uh, that's the model on the right, okay? Uh, that's the model, not this, that's me. So you can see him over there. But if you notice, let me bring this up a little bit. I'm holding it in my hand, hand holding it. I'm hand holding the camera. And I got all kinds, of, I got the, I got the um, strap around my neck in this case. And I also have it around my wrist. I really don't want to take a chance on dropping this, okay? It, it, it can happen, it does happen. Um, photography really requires a lot of thought. I mean, unless you, you know, just go to point and shoot away, turn on a point and shoot and go out there and, and blast away, which is fine. I mean, a lot of people buy these cameras so they can document family trips or a sporting event or a wedding or a bar mitzvah or whatever. It's great, put it on automatic and you're gonna get the shot you want. I'm looking for something different. I'm looking for art. I'm looking for something that I see in my mind's eye. I wanna create, I wanna produce something really nice. I mean, I can't handle a paintbrush very well, nor can I handle the graphite, but I can do certain things with the camera. And automatic settings are not gonna allow me to do that. Uh, one of the things, I always shoot in manual requires a lot of thinking and you make a lot of mistakes but that's how we learn okay so anyway here I am utilizing it this way and notice here I have it in portrait see you can see the clamp on the bottom there's my really right stuff clamp on the bottom that's for the neck clamp and here I have my strobe angle notice um, I rotated it and I have it hanging from the top you know, the beauty of a digital camera is you can look in the LCD at the end and you get instant confirmation. If it's overexposed, underexposed, blurred, dead, or whatever, you can tell. And we didn't have that with film. We had to wait until we got it back. And we had to remember things. And here he is. That's the shot that I actually took with the G11. I think the exposure is a little high on it, but you know, whatever. Uh, as you could see, it works out. Uh, before I go into the heavy duty DSLRs, um, I wanna mention an, another thing. Uh, one of the items that I see when I do workshops, and I really see it when I'm out in the field, is frustration. Uh, many people go to digital photography and they're really very, very upset. Why? Because they're not getting the results they think they should be getting. Um, very often, I, I, I see people, I hear them talking, this camera's a piece of junk. The camera's not working. The camera died. I, my, my cam I, I, can't get, I can't get anything out of it. I, I can't get my photos. They're gone. They're gone. Or terrible color. Or no color. Or this or that. It's, it's a piece of junk. You know, in all the years I've been dealing with photographic equipment and um, talking to people about it, it's very rarely the fault of the equipment. It's usually the fault of the operator. Now, I remember way back when I was taking a class in uh, advanced microscopes and uh, it was with a uh, specific kind of microscope. And one person said uh, to the professor, I, I, I'm having trouble, it's not working, it's broken. And he looked and he said, in all my years of experience, it's never the equipment, it's always the operator. And he went over and turned a couple of things and was working, and we all learned pretty quickly, figure out the problem for yourself before you go to this guy. But it's usually the case with this. And how do you handle something like that? Well, first of all, read the manual. Uh, I mean, when we're looking at these types of cameras, um, Got all these dials, buttons, levers, menus. It's very confusing, exceptionally confusing. Look at the manual and then you have to experiment yourself. Go out and use it to make it yours. You know, think about the time that you had your first bicycle or your first car and you got it. You know, you didn't know what this switch did, what that did. You didn't know turning the wheel, what it was gonna do, how it was gonna do it, but after a while, you became very good at it. Handwriting, 
uh, or, or printing. When you watch a child to think back to when you first learned how to do it, you had trouble making a slanted line. Then after a while, hey, you got pretty good at it. Handwriting, they used to teach penmanship. Took a while, you got really good at it, you could read everything. Then you made the handwriting your own, and you couldn't read anything that you wrote. But that's, you know, what could I tell you? That's human nature. Um, work with the camera, get to know it. And no two digital cameras are exactly alike. I have two 300S's, and there are subtle differences in them in the way they take photographs. And the only way you're gonna learn that is to work with it. Also, it doesn't make sense to go out and buy the costliest, best piece of equipment when you don't know how to use it. I mean, somebody who's just took uh, their first week of violin lessons doesn't go out and buy a Stradivarius. I mean, they could, but it's not gonna make anything sound any better. But if you took Yitzhak Perlman and you gave him a used violin from a music school, he could put on a concert that would just blow everybody away. So it matters on learning how to use and work with the equipment. Another question comes up to me, people will often say, why are you concentrating on strobes? Well, flashes, they're scary, they're alien, they don't work, they're hard to use. Well, I'll tell you why. Nothing else really works. You know, the big thing that uh, I'm, well, I'm always asked this particular question, about ISO or ISO. ISO or ISO controls the sensitivity <clears throat> of the digital sensor. By increasing it, you make it much more sensitive to light, which means it'll work in a low light situations. Now in the old days with film, we used to use ISOs of um, 25 with fine Kodachrome. Outdoor film was usually 100. A really fast film, like black and white uh, Tri-X, was 400. But you paid a price with it. You couldn't get the fine detail. You got something called grain, which was formed by the halide salts. But it has a nice effect, and people liked it in portraits and whatever. But if you were doing fine photography, uh, me, I was doing scientific photography. You just wouldn't cut it. I had to work with Pan-X, and I had to work with the stro. And boy, it w wasn't fun. I and I had to learn all of it myself because there were no books. Nobody could tell you anything about it. Um, there are digital SLRs today that you can crank up to 15, 20,000 ISO. I mean, they're so good. It's like a bat seeing in the dark. Uh, the best cameras <clears throat> work very well with this. But that's in the realm of people who shoot rock concerts or any kind of concert or nightclubs or sports photographer and they need the speed. I'm talking about a Nikon D4 or a Canon 1DX. You're talking also about six, that six to seven thousand dollars for a camera body. Um, <clears throat> and you're not going to get the detail. So I prefer to keep my ISOs down below 200 unless I really have to. Uh, because with the high ISOs you get something called digital noise. <clears throat> which is akin to grain. And um, this is uh, going to degrade, it's, you're going to lose highlights. Okay, the other thing that people will talk about today is some of the new lenses come with vibration, uh, uh, Nikon calls it VR, vibration reduction. Canon calls it IS, image stabilization. And people get the idea, you know, you hold the camera and it's going to give you a great shot. No, it won't. It'll give you a couple of f-stops, maybe a slightly slower, sh uh, slightly faster shutter speed. How those work? First of all, they don't work in compact systems. They only work in the lenses, the better lenses of these cameras. What you have is pitch in your, this is pitch. You know, like when you're saying goodbye to somebody? This is your. There are uh, electromagnetic processors within the lens that'll correct for that. And by the way, if your subject is moving fast, it's not gonna do anything with it. It's just about camera shake. That's why we use the strobe. Let me give you a little bit of history um, about the strobe. Uh, I'm calling it a strobe. Actually, they call them flashes and speed lights. There was a professor by the name of Harold Edgerton who in the late 1930s started working with this mainly for um, 
mechanical applications in machines and in industry. Best thing I could tell you about it is um, in the old days when they would do the ignition on a car, they would use a, um, uh, a timing light that would freeze the motion and, and you could move it back and forth. Well, these types of timing lights were used on propeller blades, on airplanes. And sometimes if you see an old movie, you'd see the propeller blade turning and all of a sudden it seems to be going backwards and doing weird things or stopping. That was because of the frame rate on the motion picture and the light hitting it. You're getting what they called, uh, you know, this was this stroboscopic effect. <coughs> what the strobe did was it would freeze motion. Edgerton took it further. He was the first guy to actually make these photographs of the drop of milk hitting the, the um, uh, clay plate and you get these great patterns, all these things. You couldn't see that with the human eye but the strobe froze it and it imprinted it on film. He had an arrow going through a balloon, uh, a sword cutting through, a, a row, all these great things. And then World War II broke out and Harold Edgerton disappears. The US military grabbed him. He was a US top secret. They got him to work on the Manhattan Project. Um, but the, his greatest feat, which he did this 70 years ago, which really gives you an idea of flash photography. Um, <clears throat> intelligence was having problems. They were bombing, obviously, Germany. And they needed to know where troop movements were, where armaments were, and how successful the bombing raids were. And it wasn't too easy to get somebody on the ground shooting fo photographs. And you couldn't really get a plane up there during the daytime either because it would get shot down. This guy, 70 years ago, comes up with a system where an airplane in total darkness, total nighttime, was flying a couple of miles up at speeds in excess of 200 miles an hour, shooting the ground and getting reasonable resolution of what's going on in black and white. And this was a military secret for quite a while. And this ended up as our high-speed flashes of today. Um, he went on to develop other things, ground-penetrating radar, <laughs> side-scan radar, uh, a, brilliant, uh, a brilliant individual. OK, so that is why I use the strobes. OK, let's we'll take a look now at the digital SLRs. You're going to also see a lot of the photos that I took were taken with the compact system. This was taken with my G11. Look at this. Look at the detail. G11. OK? And the strobe. All right. If you notice over here in Lightroom, uh, the orchid show, I did do some Photoshop work on it. That's a PSD file. It would be raw. But if you notice, ISO 100, my flash did fire. I used the Canon and I used the G11. Pretty good, okay? This also, G11. I didn't even have the G15. I think the G15 might even give a better image. But look at that image. Now remember, these are about an inch. These are about less than a quarter, the size of a quarter around a nickel. And once again, this particular image is a raw image. I, I, I did not. Um, I did not use for I did not do any editing on this. This is right as it came out of the camera. Okay? I did use a 60th of a second, which was bad. I used F8. Why did I use F8? Because that's the smallest aperture I can get with the G11. It doesn't go any smaller than F8. 
Okay, let me show you the problem I had that I used a sixtieth of a second. You know, there used to be um, a rule, well there still is a rule, which basically says the slowest shutter speed that you would use when you handhold a camera is one over the focal length. Or as the tech guys would say, one over the reciprocal of the focal length. Let's just say one over the focal length. And with the single lens reflex cameras, they all used to come with a 50 millimeter lens. Why 50 millimeter lens? Because it approximates the angle of human vision. So uh, it comes very close to that. So they said if you were using a 50 millimeter lens, one over 50 would give you 1 50th of a second, and all of those mechanical cameras at that time came with a shutter speed of 1 60th of a second. So that was the sh slowest shutter speed that you can do without getting lens shake. And there's some people that say, well, you know, you're cranking holy, you get maybe, maybe. Um, if you had a 100 millimeter lens, 1 100th of a second. If you got a 200 millimeter lens, 1 200th of a second, and so on and so forth. That's why I use strobe. One of the things that the flash does, bango, it freezes that motion. So even if I'm using a slower shutter speed and the shutter is set right, it's going to hit it and it's going to imprint that particular image even though I'm using slow. But I really shouldn't. Um, today's digital cameras work very differently with their shutter mechanisms than the old mechanical cameras. Um, the stro the, the um, speed light will sink at a higher shutter speed. I can use shutter speeds of a 200th of a second. Um, Nikon has high speed sync where you can go to an 8,000th of a second. And um, the way that these work, you know, the old, the newer cameras today have what they call curtains. And they essentially, when you hit the shutter release button, one curtain goes down and another curtain comes behind it and closes it off. And uh, that's why you'll sometimes see front curtain, rear curtain, something else to confuse people with. <laughs> but when you're going at a very, very fast shutter speed, you just basically have a slit that's moving there. What these speed lights do today, the better ones, is they're sending out pulses one after the other. So it lights up the entire frame, it hits the entire frame. Uh, with it. You know, um, people think that, wow, you know, one eight thousandth of a second is really fast. Yeah, it is fast. But light's a little bit faster. A particle of light moves in one second 186,000 miles. Uh, that's pretty fast. So, I mean, this, this thing moving at, uh, you know, an eight thousandth of a second, I mean, the light could, you know, just go like this, you know, real slow with a crutch and get through there and have plenty of time. But uh, what tends to happen is the exposure starts to cause problems. Let me show you what happened over here. You notice at the top something which you really wouldn't notice when it's not enlarged. There's some ghosting. Yeah. Ghosting is caused by a shutter speed that's a little too slow. There might have been some movement taking place. I don't know, maybe somebody bumped me. Maybe a breeze came and, and moved that. I don't know. A sixtieth of a second is pretty fast. And that, um, since this was a compact system camera, I was using the sensor is a lot smaller than the size of a 35 millimeter. Another thing you have to realize is that as you magnify an image, as you make it bigger, you make it 10 times the size, well, any shake is going to be magnified by 10, or by 100, or by 400. And that's what happened over here. Uh, I'm usually careful about looking at the camera. Yeah, but sometimes you get excited and you forget to turn this and you forget to turn that. Remember, I'm usually shooting manual. Look at that. That's, uh, detail on that one is right up there. Look at that. G11, handheld strobe. Same thing, G11, same situation. Look at this. Look at the depth of field that I have. Remember, these are small, but look at my depth of field. And I was with a lightweight camera. And some people say to me, you know, these strobes are heavy. You mount it on that G11 with that really right stuff bracket, it's not. I mean, I could one-hand it. 
Uh, one other thing, when I was using uh, that particular setup yesterday, uh, I was using my black rapid strap, which clicked in on the bottom, because it was the only thing I was carrying, and it was a lot easier to just let it dangle and just pick it up than have it ha hanging around my neck. And when there's a lot of people around, too, I'm, I'm a little leery about that. Having something hanging, you know, I, I'm very, I try to be conscious of crowds. Usually when I go to these situations, I try to go to it at a time when nobody is around, there are less crowds. Or if there are crowds, I'll wait until there aren't. I mean, I live in New York, so I can go to these t things anytime I want. Many people that come there, it may be the only time in their life that they're there. I'm not, I'm not going to block their uh, ability to take a photo. I don't, I don't think that that's right, but you know, that's the way I think. Okay, so anyway, we have that particular kind of situation with this camera. All righty. Uh, let's hold the questions until I finish, okay? Um, I'll, try, I'll, I'll probably cover a lot of them, and um, I'll tell you how I got some of those situations. This is a Nikon. I have a D800 over there. That was what I was working with. And this is my Nikon SB900, which is a heavy strobe. It's big. Uh, it comes with its own diffuser. I don't have to go out and buy one as I had to with the smaller uh, speed flash uh, from uh, Canon. And I have the built-in speed light up. I told you it's a piece of junk. The only reason I have it up there is that'll act as a triggering device for the Nikon speed light. Uh, I can go into the menu, set it in Commander, and it will set that off. So if I put it down in various places. Uh, the lens I have on here is the 105. It looks different because it is. That lens is 20 years old, maybe more. Uh, that's the old um, 105 with the built-in hood. I really like the hood that it has on it. And um, that's my camera strap, shoulder strap. And I Velcroed it to get it out of the way. There it is with the SU-800. The SU-800 is their infrared trigger which fits into the hot shoe. And I like using it because it really throws out a blast of infrared. And it will work if it's slightly off to the side or behind me. Um, sometimes people will say, do you ever hardwire the strobe? You know, uh, connect a uh, cord to it? Yes. Uh, not in the garden. I, I usually find I don't have to. But if I'm doing action shots, like if I'm trying to get animals or something in, in the zoo in a situation like that, and over there I'm going to have my camera mounted on a tripod with big, uh, usually 200 to 400 millimeter lens, and I'm walking around with that thing. Uh, if the angle is bad, the infrared may not hit it. Um, so I would prefer to uh, keep it uh, wired, and then it'll work. But I very, very rarely uh, bring the uh, cables with me. I always try to use the infrared device. Same bracket that I used with the G11. I'm going to use that same exact bracket with the Nikon. And yes, I have the um, L-plate for it. And here you can see my little... And here I am shooting this little guy here again. I have the speed light on the table. And in the garden, I mean, no one's going to stop you from putting it on the ground. If it's not too crowded, you know, put it on the ground and, you know, aim it up. These things are low. You know, you're moving around a lot. Uh, the only problem is, is in my overzealousness to get this shot, <laughs> I don't have either the strobe up or the um, uh, SU-800 up, which means it's not going to do anything. But, you know, for our intents and purposes, uh, it will work. Here I am holding it, holding the speed light. Once again, it's giving me control. I can do what I want with it. Uh, another thing I, I, I want to mention, I told you I always shoot manual. Um, it gives me control. Uh, there are automatic settings. Sometimes if I go to automatic settings, I'll use aperture priority. 
or I'm going to choose the aperture. Why? Because aperture gives me the most control over depth of field and over exposure. If I go into aperture priority, the camera is going to choose the correct shutter speed based on what it's metering in light. Um, unfortunately, uh, it gets a little messed up when you have a strobe on it and it'll throw it down to uh, the lowest sync speed, which is a 60th of a second. So uh, I, I, I want to be sure I'm in manual. I can set my sync speed at 300th of a second or 250th of a second. How do I know? What I'm getting is right. I'll look at the camera meter, but it's also experience. I mean, the first couple of times I'm doing this, I I'm looking. It's overexposed. It's underexposed. It didn't even come out. I see it. I play with it. I use it. I try it. Next time I go out, I have a better idea of what I'm doing. And there he is. That was with the 105, the 105 millimeter lens. Um, I always shoot my photographs in raw imaging. And um, mo many people will stay with JPEG. Okay, let me explain the difference. A raw image, and not all cameras will shoot raw. All of them will shoot JPEG. My iPhone will shoot JPEG. JPEG is a compressed image. It's a small image. It doesn't have as much information for one thing. I want that information. If I want to work with it, if I want to get the detail, if I want to blow it up the size of a house, I can't do it with JPEG. I can do it with RAW. But there's another little secret. Camera manufacturers want the consumer to be happy. And with most point-and-shoot cameras, they know the person is going to put it on automatic and they're going to go out there to their heart's content and everything is going to come out just right. The camera has its own built-in software. When you shoot a JPEG image, the camera is going to decide on contrast, on sharpness, on everything. The camera is going to make these decisions for you. I don't want the camera making the decisions for me. I want to make the decisions myself. I was once at a workshop someplace. It had to do with underwater photography, and somebody asked the instructor, you know, he about um, uh, using program mode or automatic. You ever use it? And he looked and he said, "No, you never use it." And he was a scary guy. And someone said, "Are there ever any exceptions that you could think of?" And he said, "Yeah." He said, you know, you're down on the bottom and you know, you see this item and you're trying to get a nice close up of it and you have your camera set, you know, for the close up and manual. And all of a sudden out of the corner of your eye, you see a school of whale sharks. You turn the damn thing to automatic and just start shooting because you'll get something. But otherwise, I, I don't bother. As I said, I want to be in control and that's the only way to learn your camera, learn what it could do. Okay, here I am using the 105. You can see it's the old 105 with that really nice um, hood on it. And I have my strobe set up on top. And it's in portrait mode. This is, uh, I'm using a, a, bl a, a Black Rapid strap. And you can see I have. Uh, uh, a really right stuff clamp and it, it, it fits in on the bottom. And there's my red black rapid strap. Very, very handy. It's also going at a diagonal. I can pick the camera up. It's not on my shoulder waiting me and it's not on my neck. Uh, so very handy device. <coughs> and here's another shot. And here we go again. Here is that same pro bracket for really right stuff. I could use it on all of my cameras. And this is the cold shoe that I was talking about. The um, uh, bottom of my speed light fits into this. And if you notice, it has this um, circular, uh, actually hemispherical base on it and that'll snap right into the lock. Very, very, very good system. You can go to them online, RRS, really right stuff. They're out in California, they're great. Uh, and they do not do retail. 
I mean, I'm, I'm sure any of these stores would, would kill to uh, ha have their items. They'll be at, the, uh, you know what, I don't even know if they go to Photo Expo. I don't think they bother. They're not interested usually because they have their following. All right, here is the um, bracket set up. And you notice I can move it in such a way that the commander will sit up there. And that's a pretty heavy system. But once again, if you can hand hold it and you don't have to worry about camera shake. Okay, this lens is a little bit different. This lens is the Nikon 28 to 300 zoom lens. It's called a travel lens because it focuses externally. You know, it'll, it'll move out, forward and back like a telescope, and I have my trusty hood on it. And it works very nicely. I'll, I'll show you some of the images from that slideshow that I got with this exact setup. And note once again, I can do all kinds of nice things with that um, speed light. And if weight is a problem, you can use your, uh, you know, shoulder strap. Uh, one of the um, camera straps that I use, uh, the one that you see Velcroed up all the time, is made by Think Tank. And the main reason I use it is I use a lot of the uh, Think Tank um, uh, harnesses and speed belts plus the backpack. And I have clips on it that fit really nice into the two little holes on there. So the entire weight of the camera is going on to the back straps and the shoulder mechanism. It's not on my neck. So I could have 20 or 30 pounds of gear and it's going down my back and my And it's really great. It works out very nicely. And with this setup, it'll work very well. And here I am in action, holding it up. You can see the lens telescoping out um, on this because it's external focus. And I always, always, always use a lens hood. And the reason for that is you get a lot of external reflections coming off. And stray light, if it gets into the lenses, it will hit the blades, the diaphragm of the aperture. And that's why you sometimes see all these little hexagons or octagons. Sometimes it's nice. Lots of times you're going, it, it, it's wounding my photo. You're getting extraneous light coming in, an extraneous reflection. And these hoods will knock it out. I mean, it's the same thing when you're outside and it's bright sun, you know, you're like this. Uh, that's what these do. That's one of the things I don't like about a compact camera system. There's no hood on there. There's no way of putting a hood or a filter on it. Nope. That was taken with that exact setup. And um, all right, that one, I, well, I, I know I worked in Photoshop with it a little bit, but you can see 1 400th of a second at f14. Try to hand hold. In natural light, f14, and, and at one six hundredth of a second, then you're going to see what's going to happen. You're going to get nothing. Uh, it worked out very well. My ISO, interestingly enough, my ISO was a thousand, but I was using I was using the D800. Normally, I kick my ISO down, but you know sometimes we tend to forget. You can play little mental games with this. Hopefully, it'll prevent me from getting Alzheimer's. <laughs> All right, let's see what I did here. Um, I do see some digital noise. I also see some dust particles and little hairs hanging from uh, the orchid. Uh, over here, there's something. Let me throw it up. I used Photoshop over there. There was a branch coming off the side, and I just really wanted to clean it up. As I said, you know, sometimes I'll use it, sometimes I won't. Um, I like to keep my photos as simple as possible. It depends what I'm using it for. Uh, if you're working for a client, yes, use Photoshop. Give them what they want, not what you want. Talk to them and, and, and whatever and see what they want. Um, but 
Look at that. That's the travel lens and that same exact setup. Look at that. Look at that detail. You know, a little hair on there. That was not on my lens. That was on the uh, that was a piece of a dust particle that was on the actual orchid. This is what is it? Phalaenopsis. These are about I don't know an inch and a half or something like that. I'm not sure. But um, all right, that was a PSD file. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, one four hundredth of a second at f nine, and my ISO was one hundred. A question that always comes up. People always say, "How do you get that background? How do you get?" that jet black background. Well, first of all, you have to be able to isolate uh, what you're looking at. You want to be able to um, make sure that there's nothing close by that particular um, flower. Or maybe a wall in the distance. I don't want a whole group of flowers behind it. I just want to get that hopefully by itself. Then you're going to use a very small aperture, a high f-stop, above f10, f14, maybe even f20. You're going to get focus right on it, your exposure is going to be right on it, and you're going to blast it with that strobe at that particular point. So what happens now is since I'm shooting at a fairly high speed, I told you that the light is going to be pulsing. It's not as powerful. It's going to get kicked down. It's not going to hit anything and back off. My shutter speed is fast enough that anything in the back is not going to show up. And I'm going to get this. But if you do use Photoshop, and even if the background isn't fully blacked out and you want to do it, very easy to select here. Because look at the contrast. I mean, black, jet black and white. So that's how you get this particular kind of photograph. These guys, they are very small. I took them with the same lens. Okay, here you can see that uh, these flowers are fairly close together, but um, I am getting some separation. I am getting some blur in the back. There is some dust, but the guy up front is pretty clear, pretty sharp. Look at that. This was some work that was buried. Um, one of the professors who uh, teaches at the garden, who's an expert on orchids, said, where the heck, where did you find that? I told him, he said, it's not there, I didn't see it. Uh, during their orchid show, they have anywhere from six to, seven, six to 7,000 separate plants. And uh, I did this over several days. I didn't go in there one day and just do all the shooting. I did this over several months, okay? In order to really get good photographs of a particular subject, you have to visit it. You can't go there once. I mean, yeah, maybe if you're on a trip of a lifetime, you're there once. But if you're in New York, you got to go there many times. I'll go there sometimes in the morning and sometimes in the afternoon. These things are alive. They're changing. They're growing constantly. And they're going to look different. So I got this one the same way, and just out of curiosity. Um, 300 millimeters, f11, f11 and a 200th of a second, okay? So it came right in. Something else that comes up with photographing flowers, I mean, I talk all about this when I do my workshop on flowers. The hardest, most difficult color to get properly is white. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, we all go by the camera metering systems. And normally when you look at camera meetings or um, exposure compensation, everybody goes to zero. Well, camera metering systems are not based on pure white. Uh, when you're looking at uh, a histogram, everything goes from pure white. Pure white is zero information. There's no information there at all. That's why it's pure white. Pure black is loaded with information and everything in between. Camera metering systems are set to 18% gray. So when you look at that 
nice white flower, and you set it on zero, the camera goes, okay, camera's not doing anything wrong. It's setting that for 18% gray. And then you look at that white and you go, it's gray. This camera's a piece of junk. This camera's, no, it's not the camera. The camera's doing what it's set to do. You have to realize that you have to go to exposure compensation and kick it up maybe a, a third of a stop or a little bit more. How do you know the best way? You take the photo and you look in the LCD and get an idea. By the way, when you look in the LCD, you're not seeing a raw image. You're seeing a JPEG. You're seeing a processed image. Okay? That's why lots of times when you get it home and you look at it, it looks different. Or when you put it into Lightroom, you're going, wow, look at that. It, 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 it doesn't look the same because you're getting your raw image. Your raw image is all the data that you are now able to work with. Okay? Uh, here's what I was talking about. Notice up here in, the, in, in this area, um, I, I shot this. I didn't do any retouching on it, but you can see everything is black except up here. This was a little close, and a little bit of light hit it just enough to register on the particular camera that I was using. Okay, now we come to my 70 to 200 millimeter lens. This is a great lens. This lens is internal focus. So it's big. I, it, it doesn't shrink down. It's big. It's heavy. It also comes with a tripod foot. Underneath the lens is a foot. You know, why don't I have a tripod foot? Well, because that's a heavy lens. And the lens mount on these cameras is not made out of titanium. You put too much weight on it, you're going to damage the mount. And it's very costly to repair it. So they have the foot, and you usually put the lens on the tripod and then back off from that. Okay? Uh, it has a nice hood, and um, it's also a lot of money. They, they are a lot more money than the external focusing. But uh, this particular lens has, uh, its widest f-stop is f2.8, and it'll hold it through the entire range of what you do. It, is real, it really gives some incredible uh, images. And this is what I use with it. This is a really right stuff ring clamp. It says on a really right stuff. And this is going to fit right on the bottom of my tripod mount. If it's Swiss Arca or really right, it'll fit right in on there. And I have this bracket. Notice the little opening on the bracket. And that'll fit into this notch over here, and it'll move on along the ring. See, here it is. And my cold shoe will snap right into that. And here I am using it. Um, because this lens has a tripod foot on it, it will rotate around it. So I, I mean, look at the control I have. First of all, the um, ring bracket, I can move my speed light anywhere I want on that and lock it in. Or I can just loosen the tripod foot and move it. So I'm getting total motion if I want to go from portrait to landscape or something in between, no problem. If I want to move the speed light any which way I want, no problem. I can move it up or down and I can rotate it. Tremendous amount of control. And it's fairly lightweight. Uh, but in using something like this, if I'm going to use the shoulder straps and everything else, really support that from the bottom. I mean, use two hands with that kind of lens. Because if it's going to dangle there, you're asking for trouble in the long run. And here, you can see it tilted even more off to the side. And this works great. Uh, when I was in the zoo using this setup, I mentioned I hardwired it. Um, I, I ran um, the um, Nikon cord directly from the hot shoe onto here. Uh, for a couple of reasons. With all the rotating, sometimes I wouldn't get a clear shot, and sometimes the image wouldn't come out. And we're talking about animals that are moving. They're not in the same position. It's not like a flower. I, I want to make sure I'm going to get it. And uh, 
So under those circumstances, but we're talking about flowers today. So with flowers, I'm using the infrared device. And I'm happy. <laughs> Good system, it works, great images. And these are some of the shots I got with it. You know what, I see a little bit of ghosting there. I'll bet you she probably went into, let's see what happened, 1 60th of a second. That's probably because I had it on aperture priority uh, and she just kicked over. No, I, I would normally have a high shutter speed on there. I had it at f9, I can do that with this particular lens. <coughs> but even with this and utilizing a strobe, things happen. That's why I said I really got to think more use the brain and, and uh, you know, just go through this whole system of what I'm doing. You know, lots of times we'll kick up the ISO to let's say eight or 9,000 and then forget about it, take a shot in bright daylight and it doesn't come out. Um, it's always a good idea to double check. <laughs> One of the things when I do my workshops is I always start off with a checklist that I have of things that I have to go through. Some of the checklists are very short. Some of them, if I'm going on a trip for two or three weeks and I have a lot of gear with me, it's quite long. Okay, look at that, the wide angle. <coughs> yeah, that was at one sixtieth of a second too. So I guess I held it tight, nobody bumped me, and um, it, it just happened to come out. And um, I was using that at 200 millimeters, the full length. Uh, I have a two, uh, the Nikon 2X converter for this thing, and it really gives sharp images. I mean, it'll give me 400 uh, millimeter on it. You know what? I, I didn't retouch that. That's an NEF. That's a, a Nikon raw file. That did not go into Photoshop. This is exactly as it came out of the camera. And look at that resolution. Look at the quality of what I was able to um, achieve by using uh, th this particular. Look at that. So if I did want to do any after processing, it really wouldn't be much of a big deal. Um, one question that comes up, people ask me about uh, using the APS-C uh, type um, sensors like the Canon DX or the Nikon EF systems. The sensors, as I mentioned, are smaller than 35 millimeter. Now, if I use my old lenses or even some of the new ones that are made for a full frame camera on there, I get a crop factor. Um, in other words, the camera, if I'm using, let's say, my 105, and I'm using it on uh, a full frame camera, it's going to work like a 105 millimeter. But if I put a DX sensor on there, or an EFS sensor on there, the sensor is smaller. The image is being focused, but it's going to be focused in such a way that it's going to be as if I were cropping it. My angle is going to be less. And with Nikon, it's 1.5. So what does that mean? If I'm <coughs> using my 105 millimeter lens, it's going to give me a crop factor of 155 millimeter. So it'd be as though I'm using 150. It's not going to give me the same magnification, but it's going to give me that crop factor. And it comes in very handy sometimes. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll show you the example when I talk about the 60 millimeter. Okay, this was taken with that same lens and that too is an NEF file. I'm looking over here <coughs> uh, in Lightroom, <coughs> 70 to 200, uh, and it says NEF. That means it's a Nikon electronic file. That's the name for the raw image. March 19th, 1 60th of a second. I guess uh, that day I was lucky. Uh, my ISO was at 200. It did fire. Might have been the quality of the lens. More so, I was lucky. Look at this shot. Now it's with that same lens. These are very small flowers. You wouldn't know. I mean, look at the way I blow it up. And look at the sharpness. 
Okay. Macro. This is what everybody wants to know about macro. Macro, extreme close-ups. By the way, close-up and macro is not the same animal. Although they're treated synonymously, they're not. When we're talking about close-up, we're talking about using a lens that uh, will usually get the subject matter that's about half to up to uh, the same size that's going to fit on the um, film plane or on your digital sensor. When you're talking about macro, you're talking about something that's going to be blown up many times. Nikon doesn't call them macro lenses. They call them micro lenses because that's what they're doing. They're acting like a microscope. They're really blowing them up. These lenses are also made for close focusing. Uh, many of the lenses, those telephotos that I showed you, for example, many of them will not close focus. They are built to move to, let's say, some of them, ten, my uh, uh, 70 to 200, I believe, is about 16 or 17 feet. So if I try to take something that's 8 feet away, it's going to be blurred. You know, many people like to say, oh, the camera's a wonderful copy of the human eye. It doesn't even come close. I mean, I can look at my watch, and I, I can look at the back of the room, and I'm getting instant focus. Try it out with somebody's camera. You know, the thing is going nuts. Here I can do it. Of course, as I'm getting younger, I have to do a little bit of this because I may need a corrective lens. But we're getting instant focus, and we can close focus. These camera lenses won't do it. A macro or micro lens is built to focus close. Um, I have set up on here, uh, I threw on it, I, I had my 105. And this is the Nikon R1C1 system, as they call it. What we have over here with this particular system is I'm using these speed lights. These are the, R, the SRB200. They are remote. They don't plug into anything. I mean, yeah, you could probably throw a PC cord on there. They're very small. Notice in relationship to the camera. Now, the R1C1 kit comes with the, uh, this adapter. And it comes, uh, I'm sorry, this is the holder. And there are screw-in adapters for various lenses that fit into the um, filter holder on the lens. And uh, here. I'm using the built-in speed flash to set this off in commander mode. Now I can crank them up, I can put them into different groups, I can turn one on, turn one off, and by pressing on these little knobs here, it releases it and I can rotate it around the holder. Uh, it also will move in and out. It'll move up and down. Now, many of you are familiar with ring lights. What I don't like about a ring light is it just gives you a flat image. You're stuck with it. This is going to give you some control. You can move it around all over the place. Here I have it set up with my SU-800 Commander. And works very well. I have a third one, which I can, ma I can put three, I can put four of them on here. But uh, this one, it comes with a little foot. I can put it down and I can work with it. And here I am using it on the side. It's on my 105. And I don't look very happy. And I'll tell you why I don't look very happy. I don't use that system. I don't like it. And the reason I don't like it is, first of all, I can't use a hood. Second of all, look at all of this junk that's sitting at the end of my one 105 millimeter lens. Can you imagine putting that at the end of my, some of my other lenses? I, I don't want to do it. It's heavy, it's clunky, it's out of the way. And you know what, I want to have a little bit more control. I want to be able to get that light out in various other areas. So, really right stuff comes to the rescue. This is a rail. And this particular rail has a clamp on it, and if you notice, it will clamp right on to the bottom. And look at these 
extenders that they have, these extension clamps, the speed light will fit right in on top of it, lock in, and I can extend these. Look at that. That's on my 105. So I can be shooting, I could have one light shooting right down on the flower, one off to the side. Look at the control I have of this. I can get almost any kind of photograph I want. Look at that. Really incredible. Okay, here's a shot. This I took with the 60 millimeter. Look, a 60 millimeter lens probably is not the best thing to use with uh, uh, outdoor photography in terms of macro work. It's really made for doing things like coins, stamps, jewelry. I happen to have one and I used it on the D300S so it gave me 90 millimeter and um, I used it with that particular system. But look at the, look at the sharpness. Look at this. This is an, an incredible shot. Look at this. And this. Okay, let's look at the 105. Now here's the 105 set up on there. I'm happy. I got my hood on there. This is with the 105. Look at that. I, 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 I mean, you're not going to do any better than this. 105. 105. Look at the lighting that I have on there. I, I, I mean, it's just amazing what you can do with this system. And here is the lens. This is the Nikon 200 millimeter lens, macro lens, or micro as they call it. Uh, I'll tell you something, it's big, it's heavy, look at the size of the hood on it. You gotta pay extra for the hood, it doesn't come with a hood, why, I don't know. It comes with a really nice leather case that I put away someplace because I keep it in my nylon cases. You have to use it with all of these other things. It's a great lens, it has a murderous learning curve. I mean, don't expect to just go out with these things and go out there and get a shot and it's gonna go on the cover of National Geographic. It's not happening. You really gotta work with these things, practice to make it yours. And here, here's the same equipment that I'm going to be using. Here I am. See how much longer it is. I'm checking the end of it, making sure it's not, nothing's falling off. And look at the results. Look at the shot. Look at that detail. Look at that lighting. This was behind glass. This was a rare plant. This was a rare orchid that they had there. They had it behind glass. It was a tiny little thing. And I really had to work with those speed lights not to get any reflection. And look at that image. Look at these. The, these are absolutely, <coughs> and I really like that one. Um, I shot it in the back. I have some information about the New York Botanical Gardens. I don't know how many of you have ever been there, but uh, it's a photographer's dream. And it's so easy to get to. Uh, people say, oh, it's in the Bronx, it's far. Hey, you know, you got Grand Central Station, you got Metro North, yeah, that was the one that went out, but it didn't go out there. <laughs> Metro North, um, on the weekends, Saturday and Sunday, they have the city ticket, $4 each way. It takes you right across the street from the Botanical Gardens, right there. You go right in there. The Botanical Gardens is 250 acres. The place is huge. You have a um, various, you have the, a forest there that is absolutely incredible. It is uh, a native forest. And um, with the right weather coming up, oh, you're going to be able to see some incredible things. Right now, as I speak, they have the chrysanthemum show going on in the conservatory. You have the ornamental conifers forest. This is something that looks like it's out of a Harry Potter movie. I mean, these trees are absolutely incredible. The shots that you can get, unbelievable. The river runs through it. You have areas you can go along on the river 
There are bridges. They have one of these bridges that was actually featured in Sesame Street. Uh, Sesame Street. Um, there is a mill that harkens back to the 1600s and it's been restored. Um, you have a rock garden there that is absolutely incredible. And they just finished the native plant garden with incredible landscaping. Obviously, during the nice weather, you can just go in there and there's all kinds of flowers on the outside. During the winter, you got the conservatory. Uh, photography classes and lectures at NYBG. Uh, gee, here's one. Fall photography workshop with me, okay? <laughs> that runs from 10 a.m. to 3.30. There's a, basically a lecture with this fellow Larry Lederman. He published a book on trees. This guy probably knows the birthright of every tree in the garden. And um, he has this book that he published, and he really knows how to take photographs of trees. And he, on Saturday, October 26, 1030 to 12, he's giving a lecture on it um, at the Watson in the Auditorium. My workshop, as you can see, runs between 1030 and 330. Knowing me, I'm usually <laughs> there a little lot later. Uh, to answer questions and to go over any of them. But in essence, I really go over digital photography, the cameras and the equipment. I'm not handling strobes on that. We're not talking about lighting. We're talking about using tripods, which is actually the best methodology to use. And um, we do go out shooting for about an hour or so where people could ask me questions and or if I see something funny going on, I, I can talk to them. A funny thing about uh, questions and, and answers, you know, uh, I, as I said, I'm in the garden a lot, I'm in the zoo, and I have a lot of equipment. And um, one thing about Americans, especially New Yorkers, if they're having a problem, they're not going to ask anybody. They don't want to know. Foreigners, however, will usually come up and say, I'm having some kind of problem. Uh, I've never had a problem where, I, a situation where I couldn't help somebody out. But here I am going to work with uh, people. Um, in whatever difficulties they have. So this is the situation that they have with the, um, uh, those particular areas. All right, membership at the garden. I have some member forms there. You could always call them up. People want to know. It's a fantastic deal. It's one of the, probably one of the best deals going if you like to take photography. Uh, they normally charge on the weekends for a, a full pass, $25 to get in, plus, as I said, $15 for parking. But if you get an individual adult pass, it's $80. They'll give you four parking passes and two guest passes. But they also have members' days. They have anyway, usually around 12 members' days, and you get free parking. So you go on the members' days and you go then, you're going to get like, uh, you know, 16 free parking passes. A dual membership for two people. They don't have to be married, uh, you know, they could be friends or whatever. $105. <laughs> you get six parking passes. Family, $125, two adults, up to five children under 16. Supporting, 275 why would you want to get supporting? Well, you get unlimited parking, and there's something else there. Early morning grounds access. The garden opens up officially at 10 o'clock. Uh, on Saturdays, they'll let you go in there at 9. But if you have the supporting, you can get in there 6.30 in the morning. The sun sets, the, you know, all these incredible shots. Uh, also, if you happen to be a senior citizen. 20% off $80, 20% off $105, 20% off $125, 20% off $275. <laughs> it's a fantastic deal and they really look out for their members. Uh, I mean they have things going there all the time. But if you just want to check it out, Wednesdays it's free. They'll let you into the ground. They're not going to let you into the conservatory or the rock garden, but you can go in there for free on Wednesdays. No problem at all. Saturday morning between 9 and 10, they'll let you in for free. They also have bird watching there on Saturdays. 
And let me tell you something, it's a major bird flyaway. Everything that comes in this area goes through there. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.